Just how big an issue is water damage to buildings in Australia, known as WDB, and what are the possible health issues from mould biotoxin exposure, like chronic inflammatory response syndrome, or SIRS? Join Amy Skilton in her online module program, Unraveling SIRS WDB, which will give you the appropriate skills to both screen and manage your patients on their return journey to wellness. For more information and to register, please go to bioceuticals.com.au, hover over the Education tab, and under Learning, click on the Online Module Programs. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield Cook. Amy Skilton has been in clinical practice for more than 17 years. However, after developing SIRS from water damage in her building in 2017, she's now studying building biology and is particularly passionate about raising awareness of environmental influences like mould on health. And today we'll be discuss discussing the prevalence, the pathology and the effects of WDB. Welcome, Amy Skilton. How are you? Happy me. My pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Now, this is a confounding, it's not a condition, it's a satellite of conditions, isn't it? Mm -hmm. but, but we'll delve into that in a second. First of all, I think the best way for us to get a handle of how frustrating and how perplexing um, these issues are mm -hmm. is to get a handle on your story. So could you take us through your story? How did it happen mm. and how did it unfold for you? So um, it was quite a year as I, I know you know some of the details for me and obviously a huge turning point in my life. So at the end of 2016, I decided to move to the northern beaches of Sydney, moved into Manly, um, to a beautiful um, two-bedroom apartment within walking distance of the Fairy Bower and had actually taken a year off my job to pursue really to all the passion projects that I had really not managed to, to get to. Mm -hmm. And what had happened just prior to moving into that property was the owners had done a renovation and unbeknownst to us and them at the time, they had, something had gone wrong um, with the bathroom renovation and the shower cavity specifically. So what ensued was over a five month period, every time the shower was being used, the water was actually seeping under the carpet and throughout the whole apartment and uh, if you've ever looked at the literage of an average shower that is an awful lot of water to be entering uh, a building and having nowhere to go essentially and of course carpet is very easily digested by mold and so uh, naked to the invisible eye underneath the carpet some pretty serious fungal and in fact microorganism growth uh, began to take hold Certainly over those summer months, we had plenty of sun, plenty of fresh air, the windows and doors were always open. So it wasn't initially obvious to us at all that there was even remotely a problem in the property. Mm. But after having a, a summer break, um, I sat down at my desk on February 1st, 2017, ready to start you know, creating all of these things that I'd always you know, wanted to produce, and never had the time or the energy to do. And at the time, I just, I was exhausted. I was mentally unable to get any traction. I found it difficult to concentrate. I felt exhausted, even though I just had three months of doing nothing but reading books and lying at the beach and, you know, enjoying myself. And so, and this is probably one of the tricky things about SIRS is it doesn't just sort of come on like a cold. It's You don't go from feeling great to feeling terrible in the space of, you know, a day or two. It's very subtle and it's very insidious. So I thought, okay, I'm obviously actually was really burnt out. Um, some degree of adrenal fatigue is still lingering. I'll just move my start date by a month. 
But what I will do is I will set up a bit of a structure and a routine and I'll get back into an exercise program and start, you know, getting myself um, some sort of schedule. And then what happened was every time I did a workout, I felt so exhausted. I had to go back to bed and sleep for four hours. And so at that point, I started to think, gosh, this is... <laughs> This isn't good. Um, and then, you know, in the middle of February, I had a, a styling session done by a girlfriend who, you know, went through everything in my wardrobe and, again, um, entirely ignorant that we were disturbing all these mould spores. And from that day forward, my health went down the toilet quite rapidly because my exposure was, you know, increased quite dramatically. So I ended up having to take antihistamines every day. I began to have insomnia at night, but was exhausted during the day. I realized on that day, actually, um, I gained a fair bit of weight. But again, I wrote that off to, oh, I've just had, you know, a few months off and I've obviously been having a very good time. Uh, it's a lack of discipline. Robin. It's this and it's that. Um, and it was only actually when I started to become incredibly unwell and we, we, you know, moved into autumn and so there was less sun that I started to notice things didn't smell that good. And it was really out of sheer luck when we first moved in, we had the strata um, request a plumber to come through because there was a leak into someone's garage below our property. And they identified actually in December, um, so about four or five months before I sort of realised things were quite seriously wrong in the apartment, that the leak was indeed coming from our place. But that was all we ever heard, and I assumed that the leak was sort of below our floor um, and that we were fine. Um, that actually wasn't the case. And it was when I sort of put two and two together, um, I think it was about April, that the penny finally dropped for me, um, that... I, yeah, engaged a building biologist and also a practitioner who I knew um, had been through this themselves, actually, and uh, and recovered. So it was, it was about a five-month gradual decline that really picked up the pace in February when my exposure um, was increased. But it wasn't immediately obvious. Each one of these symptoms appeared almost independent of the others. And I just you know, really wrote it off as I'm older, I'm worn out, <laughs> I'm overextending myself. You know, we justify these things to ourselves and they're perfectly legitimate and obvious reasons also, but it actually just wasn't the case. So, so I mean, I've gone through not, not a sir sort of thing, I've gone through a water damage building mm -hmm. exploration experience just last week and, and it's, it's plainly evident to me now, now that we've ripped open walls where water was seeping, and mm -hmm. thankfully this was just a catastrophic failure of a water heater, so it was like, oh, heck, yes. quick, get it out. Yeah. But the exploration that we did, it's amazing what is behind walls and mm -hmm. what we just, we have no idea about what's behind there because it's out of sight, it's out of mind. Mm -hmm. um, what's perplexing to me, though, is that these symptoms can be easily attributed to so many other conditions. Like mm -hmm. you mentioned having the styling ses session, getting your clothes out mm -hmm. and, and dusting them off. That's that's so typical of just, you know, getting out the last winter's jumpers and having mm -hmm. that dust explosion. But what mm -hmm. you had was something that just went further, mm -hmm. didn't it? Yes. Well, what was happening, there was all this fungal overgrowth, bacterial overgrowth under the carpet, which, of course, as you're walking around, is getting kicked up into the airspace. And, yeah. at, you know, when you're sitting on the couch, your face is, you know, closer to the source, lying in bed at night, closer to the source, those spores are spreading. And, of course, if there's elevated humidity in a home, which can occur very easily from cooking and cleaning, or your local microclimate, like here in Sydney, for example, the relative humidity is often over 70% for much of the year round. So that is perfect for mould to grow regardless, you know, irrespective of a water leak. And so over time, it was just spreading and being amplified throughout the property. But because of the good airflow and the sun, no mould was ever visible on the surface of the carpet right. and the, the the characteristic odor of it 
um, was undetectable for those first three or four months as well. And so it was just chipping away at my health without any really obvious um, indications that there was a problem. And it was really only later actually when um, the carpet staining started to come through that you could pinpoint where it was, but for a long time it wasn't apparent. And as you said, you know, these things happen in, you know, in the subfloor, they happen in the wall cavities, they happen in the roof, and all of that fungal growth is trapped, you know, in the insulation, mm -hmm. in the framing, and it takes a long time or extended periods of water intrusion before it becomes obvious to the naked eye. And so many people are living in water damaged buildings or working in them, and there aren't any obvious indications like you think there might be. Yes, that's right. Um, I want to make a, just a comment here because Anthony Briggs has, has made a great comment about the fantastic resources that are on the mind practitioner training um, mm -hmm. on the on their forum, mm -hmm. and the work of Les Leslie Embassets. Embassets, forgive me, Leslie, uh, is unsurpassed. That woman is truly dedicated. But Amy also has a course, and we can direct people to that course if you want to talk about or if you want to learn about biotoxin exposure and how that might be one of the cause causes of SIRS. As we know, um, SIRS can be caused by many different factors. We're talking today or concentrating on water damaged buildings. Mm -hmm. So for more information, click mm -hmm. on that link that should be up on your page and, and there's a, a module course that's going to be available for you. Mm -hmm. Now, um, just one thing, a point that you made about mould eating carpet. I was mm -hmm. recently made aware of a recent study, excuse yeah. the tautology, um, and they've found bacteria can eat styrofoam, mm. certain bacteria. So it's really, we have these set axioms that we know to be true, and they're true, and then suddenly they're not true. <laughs> it, there's so much more to learn. So it's really interesting that we think that once mould is contained and dried that that's the end of it mm. but there's so much more to it so can we go into oh forgive me sorry one more thing i needed to do and that was that i was alerted to water damaged buildings and how and the prevalence of that mm. um from speaking with um nicole bilsma yes and i went nah our house is fine mm. Mm. and then i noticed things it's really interesting isn't it it's a little bit terrifying, actually, when you start looking. And I always feel like the bearer of such bad news. Yeah. When I let people know just how prevalent it is and the kind of things that might, you know, bring your attention to the fact that you have a problem. But unfortunately, you know, first of all, in a water damaged building, it's not just mould. As soon as you add water to what is effectively paper or pre digested products that are easily um, able to be consumed by microorganisms, mm. you end up then living in a toxic soup of microorganisms. It's not just mold and it's not just bacteria, but it is also all of the things that those microorganisms produce. And, you know, building biologists refer to our home homes as our third skin and our home just like our gut and our skin has its own microbiome and managing and maintaining a healthy microbiome in your home is really not something that people are taught other than to regularly clean although I have to say with many commercial products we're also compromising the health of our home and, and everyone that lives inside it and so there is a fundamental gap I think for you know, the average human who doesn't right. know how how important that is. And sadly, when the health of the home begins to decline, it starts to make the people who live inside it sick. And that can look any number of ways. And we'll talk about what that um, looks like in a minute. But yeah. short term, it can be, you know, allergies and infections, um, chronic sorts um, but long term with nephrotoxic hepatotoxic neurotoxic and carcinogenic mycotoxins it's diagnoses of kidney cancer liver cancer brain cancer skin cancer 
and you you know you might be doing all of the other things um, right and then you get this diagnosis out of the blue so to speak and yet you've been inhaling and absorbing and ingesting poisons from your property um, over years maybe decades and so it's not something you want um, anyone to remain ignorant of um, and the prevalence of water damaged buildings depends on where you live actually but it's much higher than you think so the best statistics that we have um in sort of data wise is for the us so one in two properties are water damage so 50 percent of buildings offices or homes have some degree of water damage in australia estimates put put it between 10% to 50%. Uh, I think it depends on the city. I think it's way higher in Melbourne, Sydney and the Central Coast. Um, certainly uh, in one experience I had looking for a rental property, I looked at 300 properties just over and 98.3% of them were obviously water damaged. And what's terrifying about that, if 98.3% doesn't scare you, is that 80% of the time, it's not obvious. Yeah. And so, yeah, more often than not, you can walk in and there's nothing that might sort of, to the untrained eye anyway, mm. immediately pique your interest and, and make you think, gosh, um, we will, you know, this is obviously a problem um, or not. So it's very concerning. So that means, you know, probably about half of us are either working in an office that's had water intrusion that's not been fixed properly or we're living in a home. Um, there's a question here from Susan. We will talk more about the, the impacts of health on the body um, shortly. But the question is, once removed from the mold source, how long can the biotoxins continue to persevere in your body? That depends, um, Susan. It depends on your genetic makeup and whether you are a mold susceptible individual or not. And it depends on whether you are actively trying to clear the biotoxins using um, binders and other liver support or not. So I can't answer that specifically, but broadly speaking, if you are not genetically susceptible, actually, sorry, it also depends on how long you lived in that property. It also depends on how much adipose tissue you are carrying because that's where it gets stored in your body. So if you are slender, you're not carrying too much body fat and you are not genetically susceptible and your liver is working well, I know you and I have trouble, just kidding. <laughs> um, moving to a healthy home, your body should be able to clear them relatively quickly. And that might be weeks or months before they're completely out of your body. If you are someone, however, um, who is heavier, you have a lot more of a storage facility. If you've been in that property for some time, you're going to be fairly loaded up. And if you are genetically susceptible, then your body's capability of clearing biotoxins is severely compromised and you're going to need a lot of support. It can take it can take months to years for some people to clear biotoxins out of the body. So um, it's really something avoidance is absolutely the key, and minimising exposure is the key. And once you've had exposure, you really want to be much more vigilant about where you go and what kind of properties you live and work and play in, because um, you are more susceptible to injury from those biotoxins once you've had a significant exposure. Just to follow on a little bit about how do you know if you've got a water damaged building? I mean, mm. I live in a 1970s odd, late, late 70s uh, home on the Gold Coast with, you know, that we, we jokingly say the 1970s Gold Coast building spec. Mm. And that was, you know, incorrect placement of, of uh, walls, the pla incorrect placement of sheeting. Mm. Uh, it, dubious waterproofing in the bathroom, which is in one of the bathrooms, which has been redone. Yes. And certainly the bathroom downstairs that's been affected recently, mm. totally and utterly inadequate. 
Yes. Totally and utterly. Yeah. So, like it was, it was, it looked like it was a home reno done mm-hmm. by a weekend warrior. Yeah. No? Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And that's, um, that's also part of the problem as well. In fact, I'm just going to bring something to everyone's attention. Um, Carol Parr, who, by the way, is the building biologist who came to my rescue in Manly. Um, right. Carol, Hi, Carol. Yeah. Carol is a Sydney based building bio, uh, biologist. Her business is called Mighty Fresh. And she was able to get to me really quickly at that point. When I was very, very ill and um, and we were renting and we were in a battle with the property manager who was denying that there was a leak and that there was a problem. And fortunately, we knew from that plumber coming in five months earlier that, that it actually likely was that. But she's on the ground here in Sydney, which is, of course, one of the mouldiest cities in Australia. And she's saying eight and ten properties for Sydney she's seeing um, uh, have water damage. And uh, that figure doesn't surprise me at all because you've got obviously Sydney for example you've got um, high relative humidity around the clock Um, so you've got a geographical bowl where um, we're built on an aquifer and the heat causes all of the moisture to rise into the air so if you're not controlling the microclimate inside your home you're going to have a mold problem without ever having a leak but we're also an old city I've got old plumbing Um, but in addition to that you've got uh, a building code that falls well short of adequate in a number of areas um waterproofing being one of them but the the move towards more energy efficient homes we're creating buildings that can't breathe and therefore there was a study done by oh gosh i forget his name now but um he he was able to show that new apartments built in tasmania 85 percent of them had a mold problem by their first winter because they were too watertight We need to get that balance of preventing external water intrusion but allowing moisture vapour to leave because each person on a daily basis... Breathes. Well, it's it's your breath, it's your sweat, it's your cooking, it's your washing. There is on average 10 litres per person generated inside the home each day. Now, if you are not extracting that with a dehumidifier or the humidity is low outside and you can open the windows to let the water vapour go out then it's going to be absorbed by your pillows, by your mattresses, by your couch cushioning into the plasterboard of your walls and the insulation behind it where it's going to rot everything very, very slowly from the inside out. And so it's something that as home occupiers we we aren't taught. Um, And so there are some key things I think um, people do need to be aware of, monitoring the humidity in their home and managing it and also being aware of common points of moisture intrusion and having just a basic moisture meter at home so you can pick things up much earlier than they tend to be identified as well. Um, So another question from Susan. Thanks, Amy. If you have a positive reading for mycotoxins, Mm. does this mean you actually have the Mm mould, e.g. the aspergillus inhabiting your system, or can you have mycotoxin exposure coming from the environment without endogenous infection that's a good question Mm, we will be getting to sort of the patient side of things shortly Mm -hmm. but um in answer to this a positive mycotoxin result doesn't give you a lot of information at all and so it's not a test i ever use or recommend it is entirely possible that you have ingested mycotoxins although if that was the case you're probably going to be quite unwell. Um, It is also possible that you have a fungal infection in your body, but generally speaking, most mycotoxin results are generated from mycotoxins produced in your immediate environment. And so that could point to a water-damaged building or mould in your car um, and things like that. So it doesn't help you identify the source. Um, but, you know, if someone's run that test and it's shown up, you can identify by what mycotoxins come up, what species you're being exposed to, um, and that might assist you in identifying where to start looking for the mould that you're clearly um, co- cohabiting with somewhere along the line. So I was going to ask the next question about differential diagnosis, but do you want to go into that after our next question, which is how do patients present? Yeah, I want, when do you want to? I want to cover off how you know if you've got a water damage building. I think okay, great. All right. So, water- so let's do that because, like, to me, I thought, no, we didn't have a problem. And then I noticed, mm-hmm. thank you, Nicole, mm-hmm. noticed, you know, little spots of mildew mm-hmm. on, like, the suffete. Um, 
meaning that the drains were being overwhelmed, the gutters, mm -hmm. forgive me, were being overwhelmed mm -hmm. and it was leaking back in. And, of course, the real evidence there didn't come to fruition until we had a torrential rain and I punched the hole in the ceviche. The whole lot came falling down mm -hmm. and in, in there was just this rotten wood. Mm -hmm. But the thing was that I haven't been affected by SIRS, whereas mm -hmm. somebody else... Mm -hmm might be mm. so then you get from the water damaged building to how the patient reacts yeah 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 so let's go a little bit further into the water damaged building and the mm. detective work and then we'll segue into patient presentation how's that sound yeah that sounds good and um graham's made a timely point about water intrusion points being quite difficult to find tracking sometimes because uh with capillary action building materials just tracks, um, yeah. Water, water can um, defy gravity, usually by about one metre. If you're seeing water coming up in a moisture metre, sort of above a metre from the flooring, it's probably coming from somewhere up the top and not from the bottom. But, you know, we've seen water run uphill. We've seen um, it move in all kinds of ways that are difficult to explain. And so you really do need to... Um, call upon a lot of different tools and methods mm. to identify where the moisture is. But if you've got a mold problem, you have a moisture problem and finding the moisture source is the key. Um, a building biologist is highly skilled to do that, um, but occasionally you might need to get a, um, a, a leak detection specialist um, to, to assist. Uh, we've got a colleague actually who's um, uh, got a brand new home and the builders have struggled to even find where the yeah. water's coming in and yet she's had waterfalls coming through her walls. Um, but yeah, certainly moisture mapping, checking relative humidity in every room will give you an idea of, you know, which end of the house the problem is. Um, and then you can use a moisture meter to actually track um, where it's moving along building materials. But in terms of other ways, I think um, some of the key things are, first of all, smell. Now, smell, obviously, no tool and no test is completely foolproof. And it also depends on what kind of moisture problem you have and how intimate it, it is. So, yeah. for example, if you have a roof leak, um, when there's moisture there, you get microbial and, and fungal growth, which produces VOCs, which give the characteristic odour of a problem. So there's so, typical... Forgive me, Amy, sorry, VOCs, volatile... Organic compounds. So right. basically, um, Professor Mark Cohen calls them fungi farts. Um, <laughs> was, I love Mark. Yeah, it's like a very apt way of describing... Uh, basically, you know, just like when we consume foods that we struggle to digest properly, we can get a little gassy. Um, Mould, as it's chewing through plasterboard or insulation or whatever it is, can end up with some gas out the other end. And that can smell like any number of things. So there's obviously the characteristic musty smell that we associate with mould. But what I want to impress upon everyone listening to this is that your home shouldn't smell like anything. It should smell just fresh, clean nothingness. And so anytime there's a smell that smells like anything, that you've got a problem. So it might smell a bit yeasty. It might, might smell like vomit, dirty socks, uh, wet cow, wet dog. Um, it might smell like alcohol or fermenting mushrooms. Um, there's a VOC that smells like marijuana. Um, so anything that just smells a bit off. <laughs> Sorry. You just see a lot of people blaming us, ah, the fungi. Don't it's the that. fungi. It's definitely not me. It's not my farts. Um, so smell is number one. But the smell is indicative of active um, fungal growth, which means there's active moisture intrusion. So that means if you go through a period, a dry period where the mould dies down, the smell will disappear for a period of time. And then when another leak happens, you'll smell it. Whereas if you've got a pipe leak that's consistent, the smell yep. will remain and certainly for us once the musty smell became obvious it didn't disappear again because the water flow was consistent so smells um, are, are a big thing and same with um, items that have been stored if they come out smelling a bit funny mm -hmm. probably some sort of growth yep. on there um, obviously if you see mold you have a problem but because it's so difficult to see I would say changes in texture 
So if you start to see rippling in the ceiling or bubbling underneath yeah. the paint or the wall paint, you start to see warping or cupping of timber or skirting boards or bulging of wall cavities. They are all big red flags, stains or unusual colours. Obviously, when a house first gets built or renovated, it looked fresh. Everything was a uniform colour and a uniform texture. So anytime you start to see, you know, a bit of a shadow or a bit of yellowing or a bit of speckling, you know that there's a problem. Um, if any rooms uh, feel damp, and that might feel in summer, they might feel hot and stuffy, but in winter, they might feel you might feel clammy going mm. into them. Mm. That's a sign of moisture in there. And of course, if you've got mold on any of your personal items, so you start to see your shoes sprouting a bit of mold or your leather jacket starts to get like a white powdery substance on it or your handbags start to get a little furry. Mm -hmm. um, I, I must admit the, the mold that was growing on uh, my handbag just looked like white powdery dust. It would have been aspergillus, um, but I thought, you know, mold looked like, you know, brown, dark, stuff and so i was just like brushing that off thinking it was dust and it was actually mold no so yeah. it can be quite unexpected so if you're getting mold or your items are smelling moldy um or yeasty you've definitely got a moisture problem which means you have a mold problem that you can't yet see and didn't didn't you have a, a different colored stain on your carpet or something mm -hmm. so here's what happened uh, that was really interesting so obviously the water was coming underneath the carpet and the two bedrooms were either side of the bathroom mm -hmm. and uh, I think it was sort of more heading into our bedroom. One day I accidentally spilt a bit of water um, off my nightstand onto the carpet and I, I dried it but then it went, it sort of bloomed into this lovely orange colour. <laughs> A red cream carpet. And I can't remember how many days or weeks later it was. And at the time, because I was ignorant as to what was going on, I thought, gosh, did I spill a cup of tea or something there? It looked like I'd spilled tea. And it mm. turns out it was Willemia sebi that was like, which is an orange looking um, mold, had just sprouted because of the extra water that had dropped in that particular spot. Um, and certainly in the patch right by the bathroom, it started to go. A darker color um, but again it didn't look obviously moldy it was it was only when we lifted it that we could actually see there was a problem um, so yeah any sort of weird weird <laughs> colors stains smells I, but I have to say um, if, if you don't already have a thermo hygrometer mm. we need a couple around the different aspects of your house get yourself one so you can keep an eye on your relative humidity you want to keep it between 45 and 55 percent to avoid any problems and in all likelihood especially if you live in you know the cooler um, parts of Australia or the damper parts you're going to need a dehumidifier and I think a cheap moisture meter is probably one of the best investments you could make because that way you can check very quickly or even regularly around the bathroom areas just to make sure that nothing has occurred that you know you're going to miss for the next few months before it becomes a bigger problem. How much are these hygrometers? The thermo hygrometers are cheap. Um, they're a little LED battery operated thing. They're about $20, $25 each. I've got two. I've got one here in my office and I've got one out in the living area. And we just keep an eye on that and turn the dehumidifier on um, whenever whenever we can. Um, and I haven't even changed the battery since 2017. So that's, <laughs> right. uh, that's how good um, they are. Now, a question from Bernie there, all, yeah. who's also in New Zealand. Thanks for joining us, Bernie. Yeah. Um, uh, but where, what brands are available or, or can you recommend? We're not normally branded mm. in FX Medicine, but I think this is important to sort of get a handle on what's available. So oh, what sort of um, um, instruments can people purchase and where? So you can, here in Australia, you can get them from JCAR. You can order them online. Um, you can, uh, I got mine from scienceinstruments.com.au, but I think um, Bernie Mitre 10 would probably have them. Um, that's our Bunnings equivalent here, just a hardware store. But, yeah, I bought mine online um, very cheaply. So um, here's an... And, and it's a hydrometer. Hygrometer. It's a hygrometer. Yeah, so thermo, T H E R M O, and hygrometer, H Y G R O M 
There you go, Graham. <laughs> so, yeah, just there you go. Very, Beck's onto it. Thanks, Beck. Yeah, yeah. So very easy. I think it's one of the best investments you can make. And this will allow you to see the shifts in humidity when you're cooking, if you're drying clothes inside, if you've had like a run on a steamy, you know, shower after shower after shower, and then actively do something about it. Because within 48 hours of elevated humidity or water intrusion, you're going to have mold growth. And it only takes 12 hours of moisture for bacteria to start growing. And so it's really not something you want to, you know, look at once a week. It's really a, a daily thing that you want to want to stay on top of for sure. Okay, so a double a double question here. You mentioned mm. mattresses earlier. And yeah. from my dust mite um, days, yeah. I, I was... I'm of the mind that the mattress can contain something like 10 litres of humidity. Is that correct? Uh, sorry, say that again. I was reading a question in the chat. Uh, <laughs> let's say a number of litres yes. of, of moisture in your mattress. And you indeed mm. had a particular issue with your yeah. mattress, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. So a <laughs> mattress was a very good example of how how moisture and mold can um, bunny hop around the home and also how tricky it can be to monitor. So our mattress, we, we didn't have a futon. We had, I guess, what you consider a normal bed, X, X whatever centimetres off the ground. It also had a mattress cover on it that had a plastic bottom, but it did have ventilation holes. And uh, because it wasn't immediately on the, on the ground and, and in contact with the water, we thought it'd be okay. We did test it. We tested it for ATP, which indicates active microbial growth, and it came up okay. But that was on the surface, on the mattress cover, and it was only when the home really got fixed and the new carpet went in and we moved everything back and thought, oh, I'm just going to clean everything I can clean. I had to... Oh, I'm cringing. Oh, man, it was a shocker. And, oh, thank God I thought to do this because you know what? We moved, when we realised what the problem was and where it was coming from, we moved the bed out into the lounge room. But even, even out there, my lungs were on fire. It was like I was inhaling fire. My tissue was burning and I didn't realise that our, our mattress was completely mouldy. And, and because we were cleaning everything before we moved it back in, I thought, oh, I'll just wash the mattress cover. I'll HIPAA vacuum the mattress. And when I peeled back, the, uh, the mattress cover, oh my goodness. What we couldn't see from the outside was where the ventilation holes had been, mold had gotten in and had grown in columns up through into the mattress. We were literally sleeping on a mold pit at night. And of course, as you lie on it and the air puffs out, all of that was going into our airways at night. And so, yeah, porous things are sadly, very, very easily and quickly impacted by a mould problem. And you also mentioned, you know, the first sense of ours that is normally affronted with the smell of mould. Yeah. Um, and indeed, I've walked into my wife's work yes. and I am immediately affronted by this musty, mouldy smell. Mm -hmm. And yet Lee can't smell it. She doesn't have any health issues from it. Yeah. But I, interestingly, I took a teacher down there that I was mm. discussing this with mm. Lee works at a school, mm -hmm. and and she said, what smell? I can't smell anything. Mm. So I took this teacher down there, and then she said, oh, yeah, now I can. Mm -hmm. What's interesting to me is why could she not before? Is this part of the, the genetic susceptibility of people to or certain patients to have um, this incredible reaction to mould, whereas other people just don't? Oh, yeah, it's mouldy. I'm not clear on the relationship between susceptibility and ability to detect the smell. Right. So, um, for example, my husband does not have a, a mould susceptible gene and, and his sensitivity to smelling it is better than mine. Um, but that being said, I also um, work, live and work at home and so I'm never refreshing my senses and our senses can become dulled. They become dulled to constant pressure. They become dulled to constant stimulation. This is why I think they say you can only smell like six different essential oils or perfumes before your ability to actually pick up all the notes dies off and you've got to sniff coffee beans to redo it. Um, the only reason I have so much coffee, I mean, yeah. <laughs> my nose are tuned. 
The other thing, though, is there are specific mycotoxins that damage the olfactory bulb, and you know potentially this is a survival mechanism by mold in order to evade detection. And so, for anyone, the longer your exposure, the less likely you are to you know pick it up. And certainly, if you um, are constantly in that property, you won't. You just get used to it. You adjust to your your immediate environment. Whereas, you might go out you know, all day running errands and then come home and then go, oh, okay, that I can smell something now. So, yeah, it's very, a bit of a mixed bag, um, but certainly um, by refreshing your nasal passages, you'll, you'll be able to pick things up more easily. Now, there was a question there about um, a dehumidifier. I'll just answer that yeah, now. Um, there are two main different types of dehumidifier and the best kind to get really depends on where you live, your microclimate, the needs of your property. So I'd encourage you to get a recommendation from a building biologist um, who can base that on your own um, geographical location and, and challenges with your property. But the other thing to bear in mind is the capacity of the dehumidifier and whether you're going to plumb it in or not. So yeah. um, I work from home, so even though mine is like quite a small um, bucket, like four litres, I think, I can empty it. It kind of needs emptying, I don't know, once every 24 hours, sometimes slightly more frequently, and that works for me. But if I was, you know, in a, in a damper place, and was unable to control the the climate like I do, I'd probably need a bigger container or to plumb it and yeah. permanently drain down the bath or something. Um, I could just see that, at, you know, if you weren't on top of it, I could see that adding to the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Yes, absolutely it could, um, especially if you just leave it sitting in there and then you've got all of this um, moisture sitting there. Uh, there's a question here from Ben. For someone who can't move but is suffering from serious mold-related symptoms like severe rhinitis and eczema, can their symptoms still improve significantly if the, you don't remove the mold source? No. Sorry, no. Um, the best thing you could do if you can't move at this stage is set up a tent in your backyard. Um, but the tricky thing with camping, especially at this time of year, assuming you're in Australia, is the dampness outside. Um, so you'd have to be very careful with the kind of things that you, you buy. So if you own it, then you need to get a good building biology assessment done so that you can claim on insurance for water damage and have it remediated. Um, if you're a SERS patient, um, sometimes even a medical grade remediation might not be enough to improve the home, but it, it should be enough to improve rhinitis and eczema symptoms. Um, if you rent um, and there's a moisture problem there, you can't at this stage legally force the landlord to do the right thing, but you can, however, get um, out of your lease and get compensation to some degree right. or another. Um, that's something I help clients with quite regularly um so but yeah there's no way you can live in a moldy property and expect oh. to improve without doing something about it um so either way you've got to take action um but if you're stuck somewhere for the time being i know with covid and restrictions on movements and things yeah. It's very difficult. I'm going through this right now myself, um, and it's very stressful. Um, a camper van or a tent or something outside and come in to do, you know, um, washing, cooking, cleaning, stuff like that, but uh, improve your air quality as much as humanly possible. If it's limited to a room in the house, you could possibly seal off the room and do some basic remediation in the rest of your home. But wherever you sleep, so during the day, you can obviously get out of the house, right? You know, in the daylight hours, you can spend time somewhere else, unless you're in Melbourne, actually. Gosh, I hope you're not in Melbourne. Um, but There's a few. Yeah, but wherever, you, wherever you're sleeping, you need clean air and, and not to be exposed to mould. Um, I'll just check if there's any other good questions here. Well, there's just an interesting one from Milva. Are older homes worse than new ones or does it mm. not matter? And it's amazing that the variance in building code and then regardless of code, you've got the the um, tenacity, if you like, of the builders to mm. stick to that code. It's honestly a dog's breakfast. Um, yeah. It's heartbreaking, actually, when you, you look under the hood of the building industry. Um, it varies state by state. The Australian, like the National Building Code, they're trying to improve it, um, but, you know, these things don't improve quickly and then you've got all these existing buildings that have problems. No. Um, Milva, it's, it's a bit of a mixed bag. It's kind of like which problem are you are you up for? If it's a mm. new build, 
um, and let's say no one's lived in it and it's not in a, it's not in Sydney and therefore been exposed to humidity, you have the opportunity to control the internal microclimate. Know that it's probably been sealed up too tightly and that moisture is not going to get out properly. You can go in with your thermohygrometers and your dehumidifier and keep it completely dry. Great. What you, what you don't have control over though, if it's an apartment, is what everyone's doing next door and above and below you. Um, an older home, the, the more drafty homes actually tend to be better on occasions, the double bricks. Um, but then the older a home is, the more likely you've had earth subsidence, maybe pipes shifting, breaking, um, springing a leak. And so there's no, there's no magical answer um, unless you are lucky enough to have an unlimited budget to build your own building. By this, I mean, we, we could talk for hours about this. I, yeah. I could tell you about the five layers of waterproofing I did and, and I exceeded the building code to make my bathroom mm. renovation a fishbowl. Mm. There was no way that I was going 30 centimetres outside of the wet area. Yes. <laughs> it's a fishbowl. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we have to move on because yeah. we're running out of time. So, mm. Amy, these patients, indeed you, like, like you're a resilient, strong woman mm. and yet it crumbled you. How do these patients present mm. when, particularly when, it's the first time you've ever seen them. Like we yeah. saw the changes in you. So we were well aware that something was wrong, something was amiss. Yeah. But the, this is the first time that somebody presents to you. Mm. How do you think water damage building and an immune reaction from that serves? Or when would you think chronic fatigue mm. serves so from tick bites, um, multiple chemical sensitivity? There's mm. so many, pernicious anemia. Yeah. What about psychological? causes there's so many it's such a talk about rabbit holes it's a it's a spider web yeah so how do you unravel that so depending on the patient's genetic susceptibility it will depend on what seems to be the prominent feature um, we know that because of all the microbes and their metabolites that um, one of the biggest red flags is um, atopic presentation chronic allergies so they don't appear to be related to the season they're on antihistamines all the time they've got eczema this, um, anyone with severe eczema child or adult is likely to be living in a water damaged building um, if it's severe especially if it's adult eczema almost guaranteed same with asthma um, asthma that's not well controlled so if someone's coming to you saying well, my allergies are out of control the antihistamines aren't working or my, I'm having a lot of asthma attacks and, and the medications are not helping me enough. Um, those are all big red flags. Um, questions to ask might be, um, you know, do, you, do those symptoms improve when you're away from home? Because these tend to be related to direct mold exposure. Whereas if you've got SIRS, you don't feel better leaving the moldy building often because your genes mean you can't detox the mold. But yeah, allergies, asthma, eczema. Um, also chronic respiratory tract infection. So people have got, keep getting pneumonia, always have a cold or a sniffle. Um, they, they, you know, they get a cold and it goes straight to their chest with bronchitis. Um, you know, because of all the microbes that are festering in a water damaged building, respiratory tract infections and skin infections are very common, weird rashes. Um, a massive red flag is, is coughing up blood and, um, oh bleeding noses uh, yeah. obviously there's other sinister reasons you might have those symptoms so of course as clinicians we're always sort of we you know it's a process of elimination from from the worst to the least um, problematic but um one of the micro one of the metabolites that stachybotrys produces actually causes hemolysis so that's a very common red flag for me if i've walked into a building that has stachy i'll have blood nose or bloody mucus um, as a result. So that's sort of the obvious acute things. Um, also patients that feel better on a gluten-free diet. So non-celiac gluten sensitivity is another common red flag. The mold susceptible genetic haplotypes are all the celiac gene susceptible haplotypes. And so whilst they might not have celiac disease, um, antibodies or any other indications of celiacs, gluten makes them feel bad and they feel better avoiding it. Um, but other symptoms that can um, not be misdiagnosed but can be a result of SIRS or living in a water damaged building are chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia. So anyone with a diagnosis, either of those two, 
you've got to investigate what the cause of the cause is. So someone might say, oh, you know, I'm tired all the time or it's this or I'm in pain and you're like, oh, it's caught at the causes. You've got chronic fatigue syndrome. Well, you haven't looked at the cause of that. And more often than not, it is a water damaged building. I had both of those things. I had both of those things. And I don't when I'm not in a water damaged building. Um, the mycotoxins, of course, cause damage throughout the body. But one of the, the main things it does is impact um, your brain. And so changes in cognitive function, mood, um, even to the point of developing dementia symptoms. Um, you know, I had full blown inhalational Alzheimer's. I couldn't even remember my own name at one point. I struggled to hold a conversation. I couldn't work out how to get dressed. Like the, the process of which item you put on first and then after just was beyond me. At the age of 37, couldn't figure it out um, until my brain healed. So those things. That totally answers superheroes. <laughs> Underwear on the outside. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah if you if you've got a patient presenting with any of those things i actually cover this in depth in module four of the sirs course all of right. the red flags that you might see in a case history all of the questions you should ask about the patient and their home or office to kind of figure out whether they're being exposed or whether their symptoms are caused by that and of course there's the obvious sirs symptoms as well as um, defined by richie shoemaker so you know, those would, of course, pique your interest. But sometimes if they don't have the genetic susceptibility, you won't get those. And so it'll be these ones that you see instead. Um, now, we put up a little placemat there before for uh, Nicole Bilsma, a, a, an interview that I did with Nicole very early on, which blew my mind. Yeah. And indeed, it was before, I think, her book was published, which is brilliant. Oh. I was just, that's the reason, forgive me, I was looking around because yeah. I, it's down there. Okay. Um, but, but um, uh, of course, <clears throat> you'll be cover, covering sequential information in the various modules yeah. in your course, yeah. in your course, mm. forgive me, can't remember my own name, can't remember how to speak. <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah. Um, there were so many things. You've mentioned genes a few times. Yes. Can we go into which genes are we talking about here? So basically, um, there are a set of haplotypes associated with the mold gene or the celiac gene that are indicative of someone's susceptibility to becoming much sicker, much quicker on exposure to biotoxins. And in this case, we're talking about mycotoxins produced by mold, but there are other biotoxins that can also have an impact. Um, and ultimately what that means is it represents a system that is less able to, in logically speaking, recognize biotoxins to tag them for clearance. And so it's like the innate immune system kicks in. For anyone um, listening who's not a clinician, we've got sort of two arms to our immune system, the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. The innate immune system is like the first responder that sort of um, Quick. dive in, all guns blazing, you know, who cares what damage we, we make, we're going to make a big ruckus to get on top of the bad guy. And then the adaptive immune system rocks up later with a bit more of a measured approach, looking for the bad guy and targets them only. But in someone who's susceptible, that second part never kicks in because the immune system can't recognize and tag the biotoxins. So the, so the first guys, cowboys, have to keep going and, and causing inflammation and, and pain and all kinds of disruption in the whole body. And so mycotoxins will make everyone unwell. Mycotoxins will damage everyone's organs and tissues. But if you're not, if you're able to clear the biotoxins, it'll take a long time before you register something's wrong and you're being poisoned by your environment. Whereas someone like myself, who was genetically susceptible, you know, we're the canaries in the coal mine, so to speak, we are the early warning signs of an unhealthy environment, and and therefore all humans need to vacate the immediate surroundings. Mm. Right. Um, now there was one other symptom that that you and I were discussing mm. previously, a weird symptom that some people present with. Um, oh, that was hoarding. Yeah. Um, and it's a, a conversation I've had a couple of times actually and a propensity I noticed in myself. And I'm sure there are lots of reasons people end up hanging on to stuff that they just really don't need. 
Um, but I think a common thread that links it all is brain inflammation. And what I've determined since obviously coming out of this, because I started holding on to crap, absolute garbage actually on reflection once I was, was well, Here's my take on it. When your brain is inflamed, your ability to discern becomes challenged. And that includes the ability to, first of all, remember stuff and, and also like um, work out what's important and what's not. So another red flag is I used to write on my hand all the time and you, mm. you leave notes upon notes to remind yourself to look at that note. You'll set alarms on your phone. You're forgetful. Um, you know, it took me three hours to leave the house once because I couldn't find my keys. And when I found my keys, I couldn't find my wallet. Then I'd find my wallet and then I'd lost my keys again. It's honestly ridiculous. So that whole brain inflammation and yeah, the and it and it also causes a lot of anxiety as well. So you, and and you, everything feels very uncertain and unstable. So hanging on to stuff gives you a sense of security and stability and familiarity when everything else feels very wobbly. And it's also very hard to work out what's important. And because you can't figure out what's important to keep and what you should you can let go of, you keep everything. Right. You think, oh, I might need that. And so. Um, yeah. It was really interesting. I guess my personal thing was, um, well, first of all, way too many clothes. That's why I had that styling session in the first place with my friend because I had too much stuff but I didn't know what to get rid of. But also um, for me, my personal tell was I used to design and make jewellery in my spare time and um, for gifts and things. And I would often um, collect or keep broken jewellery or things I'd found to refashion into other stuff. But it got to a point where I was keeping actual garbage and I didn't, well, not actual garbage, it wasn't like plastic bags or anything, but Ew. <laughs> you know, it was broken, damaged stuff that was really beyond repair or repurposing, but it was like I was trying to save it, reuse it, didn't want it to go on the landfill. And then once I sort of healed and started going through all of my stuff again, I was looking at it with fresh eyes, or I suppose a fresh, less inflamed brain, and I'm looking at it going, what was I thinking hanging on to this? Mm. Of course, if you never recognize you're in a toxic environment and your brain remains inflamed, this behavior is simply going to escalate. It would have for me. Like if I didn't know what I know, I, I could have ended up one of those people whose, you know, homes is full of newspapers from the last 50 years, just in case I might want to read it. In fact, in fact, I had magazines that were over 10 years old that I hadn't gotten around to reading and I was... What's wrong with that? Well, look... I've got National Geographic from 1966. <laughs> you know what I mean. There's a limit. There's a limit. Um, there are so many awesome questions here. And, guys, a lot of these will be answered in Amy's course. There's so much to go through. Yeah. We're running out of time. So I need to move on. But I want to just cover about expectations. Mm -hmm for patients that you help, that building biologists help, mm. and and other people who specialise in SIRS and chronic fatigue and water damage building and yeah. their effects. And that is what? how do you set goals for these people mm. when very many times they can't afford to move? They're not billionaires. They can't afford to build their dream home with the perfect building spec. Mm. How do you make adequate remedy to a toxic situation, living situation, oh. and also look after their health. What goals do you set in place and what length? How do they respond? How do they get better? <sighs> Far out. I've got ten words. To answer this. Um, <laughs> you've got you've got three minutes. Let, two minutes. <laughs> I'll just say that this is probably one of the most most heartbreaking and challenging things to navigate and recover from. Mm. Even as someone who's a health professional who's now studied mould testing, finding a safe home has been difficult. Uh, I'm lucky to have access to um, supplements very easily in, at the drop of a hat and an amazing network, and, and it was soul-destroying for me. The answer depends on whether you own or rent, of course, um, because if you own, you've got to decide whether it's easier just to sell and move somewhere else. Yeah. or remediate uh, if you're rent you, rentals you've got to just get out of that immediately but then how do you know you're not stepping into out of the frying pan to the out of the frying pan to the wire. yeah so i actually specifically help train people what to look for um gotcha. in a rental or a um a property that they own in an ideal world you get a building biologist but it's a competitive rental market. You've got 50 other people going through. A building biologist might not be available at that time, and it's costly. 
And so you want to be you want to be ninety five percent sure it's going to be good before you take that punt. Obviously, if you're buying, it's a different story because you're investing a lot of money. But for a rental, there's a lot of things you can you can do to avoid the heartache of, of accidentally going into a mouldy property. Um, but number one is to actually get into a a safe environment, and and often that means people end up living in cars, camping. Um, and, and it can take a long time. I mean, it took me three yeah. properties to find find a home, and that was, you know, looking every Wednesday and Saturday and knowing what to look for. The treatment process, as far as recovery goes, again depends on your genetics. If you're not genetically susceptible, getting into a healthy environment might be all you need. You'll feel better within a couple of weeks. You might be fully recovered after a couple of months. Um, but if you are genetically susceptible, you'll need to work with a SERS literate practitioner to not only detoxify all of the biotoxins that your body's holding on to, but also restore balance to all of the hormones um, and the immune system that are have become dysregulated as a result of your exposure and that can take months sometimes years um, depending on your environment and and how quickly or slowly you can move someone through the process i suppose the good news is that there is a very well-worn path a well-worn protocol a step-by-step -step process um, and, and lots of flexibility in those steps too in which to, to restore someone back to full health and i think it's quite rare that it you're unable to do that. Usually the hold up is the environment um, and, and people continuing to be exposed. Obviously, if you've got a good home, but your office is mouldy, that's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. um, if you have to get public transport or buses and, and trains are notoriously mouldy, that's another challenge that someone might have to deal with. Um, but, you know, that's why I've put this course together for practitioners because the there's limited options to learn about this um and i think knowing that you know roughly a third of the population have mold susceptible genes and that roughly half of properties generally you know australia wide are water damaged one in two patients that we're seeing is likely to be impacted by a water damaged building in some way shape or form you know 30 percent of them are likely to be quite significantly under yeah. because yeah um, this isn't something that as practitioners we can afford to not know about. We, did, we didn't get time to go into the issues of, of work sites mm -hmm. being uh, the source of the water damage and mm -hmm. it'll be just be very interesting to see over a period of time with so many more people working from home mm -hmm. um, in this time of COVID-19, mm -hmm. whether these patients get better or indeed if their issue is the home and mm -hmm. if they then present with SERS and, mm -hmm. and they get worse. Um, Carol, brilliant words from you. She says, mm -hmm. take one step at a time and breathe, mm -hmm. hopefully less toxic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, one good. last question. Um, is there a list of SERS practitioners? Yeah, so certainly everyone who does my course will then be tagged in the Bioceuticals database as a SERS literate practitioner. Um, but in addition to that, there's a couple of other places you can go. Anyone who's trained directly with Richard Shoemaker, who's the US-based doctor who identified this condition and worked out how to treat it, um, he has on his website, survivingmold.com, a list of certified practitioners. That being said, there's a lot more practitioners who have done his training or done training from SERS literate practitioners here in Australia that are not on that list. So I think the best place I could point people to is there's a Facebook group called Toxic Mold Support Australia. They have a website also, you might get this wrong, toxicmoldsupport.org. They actually have a much more comprehensive list on their website that also includes functional medicine practitioners, not just GPs. Um, there's a combination of both there too. So um, you can certainly find help on those two sites and we'll also be, of course, um, churning out some well-educated practitioners at the end of the course as well. Is it the English spelling of mould or is it the American spelling of mould? Uh, toxic M -O -U -L -D. mould. So toxic mould support is uh, UK English So because it's an Australian site. M-O-U-L-D. Yeah, but for the shoemaker site, survivingmould.com, it's M-O-L-D. Gotcha. <laughs> now, uh, we did a poll while you were answering that last question and 100% mm -hmm. of people said uh, we you would love it. to keep going for an extra five, no, ten minutes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sure. So... So can we 
quickly delve into what patients can do, let's say when they realise they've got water damage, mm. what, what, what is the best step? Um, do you just rip down walls? Do you get a building biologist in? Do you get a builder in, a plumber in? What's, mm. what's the first step? Look, I think um, the first step is you've got to find the source of the moisture intrusion, which a building do they, biologist... Or do they enlist somebody? Um, yeah, a, a building biologist is probably the best, unless you've got some sort of building experience. It can be very hard. I think Graham pointed that out earlier. It's, it can be mm. tricky. Um, mm. Even for a professional, my in-laws currently have got water intrusion. They've had a plumber there for three days trying to find where it's coming from, and he can't. Um, so please get a professional immediately. A building biologist is ideal because not only can they help you find the source or sources of moisture intrusion, they can also assess how bad your place is and give you recommendations on who can remediate it and how it should be done. Now, depending on how extensive it is, you might need to seal off parts of your home and you can live in the, in the better part, the healthy part, um, but remediation needs to be done according to ICRC standards, um, which involves containment to stop contamination in the rest of your home. So please, for the love of all things healthy, don't rip down anything, don't rip up anything, don't disturb anything until you've had professional advice. Um, I know you... <laughs> There's a conundrum. I know, I know. Um, look, if it's if it's recent yeah. water intrusion, um, let's say um, something's burst, you've got 48 hours to dry it, then by all means lift up the carpet, lift up the underlay, run the dehumidifier, fans, heaters, etc. But if it's been an ongoing issue, then just don't touch it, seal it up if you can, get as far away from it as possible and get a professional in to give you a scope of works. Um, and then from there, you'll obviously have to get the leak fixed before anything else can be done and then everything else can be sorted out afterwards. Yeah. It can be a bit of a process. Um, you might want to yeah. check yourself into an Airbnb or stay with a friend if it's quite extensive. That's what we did because our whole property um, was impacted. Um, there's a question here from Susan. Did your course cover both water damage building remediation and personal remediation. Yes, it does. I've got a whole module dedicated to how building biologists um, assess things and the way in which remediation needs to be done on porous, semi-porous, non-porous things. Obviously, you don't come out a certified remediator because that is um, an entire profession in and of itself, but it does educate you on how things need to be done and who to call. And, yeah. and some of the basics that you can do yourself for, say, the, the non-porous things that are glass and metal, for instance. Um, Leanne's asked, can it be sealed by painting over? No, that's not how remediation is done. Um, and that's unfortunately what a lot of um, property managers do with mould and bathrooms, for example. They just paint over it and think it's just magically disappeared. No, it hasn't. And it will continue to make the occupants sick um, if that is done. So... Okay. Could, can you contain, though, um, obviously you must remediate the cause, the, the cause of the water damage. Yeah. So let's say it's a, a gutter that's overwhelmed and flowing inside or dripping inside. Yeah. Once you remediate that, mm -hmm. with these new plastic-like paints, mm -hmm. is it possible to, once you've done a remedial uh, clean-up of the internal surface of, of plasterboard, mm -hmm. can you effectively create a closed bubble, if you like, by painting everything, the cornices. No. no? You can't clean mould off the plastic. Damn. <laughs> yeah. The hyphae you get in and um, all you're cleaning is the surface presentation and you've got to realise there's a there's a cavity on the other side full of insulation and, and you might be able to control the moisture in the bathroom but you can't control the moisture in the, in the cavity. Right. Well, it's just going to continue to grow and poison you through the air spaces and you no longer have a visible proxy for where it is. Um, so unfortunately, no, you have to remove mould. You can't clean it off. You have to cut the plasterboard out. You've got to remove the insulation. If you've got timber framing, you may need to remove that and replace it, or you might be able to media blast and seal that possibly, um, but only a building biologist can tell you um, the degree of damage and, and how far you'll have to go, and then a remediator can kind of take it from there. And, and in your course, will you be covering the new types of, uh, of building materials that are available, like, you know, water block, um, cement sheeting, and you've got 
um, water resistant, I'm going to say it's not waterproof, but water resistant plasterboard nowadays. They're a little bit more expensive, but Jeepers in my bathroom, give me the water block. Yeah. Board. <laughs> oh boy. That's a specialist area of building biology and um, most building biologists are trained um, to some degree or another around that stuff so you can get advice from them. Um, there's one in particular, Narelle McDonald, who specialises in healthy home renos and building, um, but it's outside of the scope of the SERS course um, to talk about renovations and building, I'm afraid. Um, Bunnings would make too much money off you. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Um, um, the question here from Shalana, shall I ask yes. that now? Um, what's your advice during winter months when you have the heater on during the day and night? Will it add to the humidity and mold build up? It depends what kind of heater you have. Um, if you're using an oil fin heater or you've got, say, a um, fire, for instance, those are dry heats. Warm air holds more moisture than cold air. So you can actually drop the relative humidity in your home by warming up the air. However, gas heaters, um, especially if they're not fluid, they can actually be very dangerous. Don't do, don't use those. You've got to look out for carbon dioxide as well. But um, no, they can no. increase the moisture content of your home. Um, warming your home is a good idea because that reduces the opportunity for condensation. But you still have to solve the problem of where does the moisture go? And so yeah. the humidifier has to be a part of that as well and monitoring the uh, the relative humidity. And at least with a thermohygrometer, if you do have a gas heater and you notice that moisture level starting to climb, you can get the dehumidifier on or maybe consider an alternative form of heating um, for your property. Right. Yeah. The, um, Carol, thank you for lending a hand. There's... There's been some questions about finding some people to help them mm -hmm. in various parts of Australia. So yeah. you can obviously, you can get the the sense that this is just a bigger than Ben Hur issue and that the yeah, people attending today's session mm. aren't just concerned for themselves but so many patients of theirs as well. So yeah. this is obviously a bigger bigger issue that we really need to um, yeah. have a call for and do, that's indeed. Do. Um, um, and, yes, Sandy. Gupta was mentioned there, so yes, uh, he's on the Sunshine Coast. He was the first um, shoemaker trained SERS literate GP in Australia. Um, he's amazing. He provides a lot of support in the Toxic Mould Support Group too. He's got a course as well, um, which I think he's upgrading. We're actually interviewing him. We're trying to, oh. trying to lock him down for an interview for the course. He's um, finishing his course first. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but he's lovely and very insightful. In fact, he just recently did the mould testing technician course with Nicole Belsma. Um, so he now has a, a really powerful understanding of what to look for in a water damaged building. And I'm sure all of his patients are just gonna benefit so much from that too. Um, but for anyone looking for a building biologist, the Australian Society of Building Biologists has a database um, geographically arranged. So if you go to asbb.org.au, um, you can actually search by state and find someone in your area. Now, I will say mold testing is a very specialist elective within building biology. I think it'll eventually become a core subject. But for now, um, when you're scanning the list, any building biologist who's done mold testing has a little asterisk by their name. Carol's has one. Um, and you, so that way you know that they're equipped to, um, to do what you need them to do. Uh, there's a link that's just been popped up there. Thank you, Mel. Um, and this will assist you in finding someone local to you. Now, if you're in somewhere that's rural or you can't get someone to you, some of the building biologists also offer online stuff. Carol, let us know if you do. Um, but I know Nicole Berenger, who's actually based in Melbourne, does phone consultations and she can help guide you to do an ERMI test on your own home or moisture mapping and things like that. So don't think if there's not someone in your local area or you can't get someone that they can't help you in other ways. Uh, but obviously, yeah, Carol does Zoom consults too. Amazing. Thanks, Carol. Um, so there are other ways you can get their support and help and do assessments um, that doesn't have to um, involve them coming to your house. Um, but yeah, obviously that's Andy. the ideal. And if people want to learn just a little bit more about what a building biologist does mm -hmm. and indeed the, the breadth of people that they have with ASBB, mm -hmm. uh, Ethics Medicine was honoured to attend the ASBB 
um, conference. Oh, Gosh, was that, was that three years ago or two? Oh, oh, oh. Um, and indeed, you spoke there, didn't you? Mm. Yes, I did. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Mm. And that was where Mark Cohen, on my sign off, said, mm. FX Medicine, I'm Andrew Whitfield Cook. And he poked his head around and said, And I'm Mark Cohen. <laughs> 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 Funny guy. Guys, with that, I think we need to wrap up. Everybody, thank you so much for your questions. There's obviously so much more to cover here. Mm. Amy will endeavour to cover this and more in her course, of course. Lovely. I do it all the time. <laughs> Carol, thank you for your help as well. Mm. There's the link for Amy's course, which will undoubtedly give you and your patients some answers. Mm. And, Amy, I've got to thank you from a, a a devastating thing that really did crumble you a little bit. You've come from strength to strength and you've you've not just unraveled the pieces or, or the web, but you've put the pieces back together, not for just for your life, but you've figured out a way to help so many others. So mm. thank you for your input and, and your work with regards to SIRS and, and Water Damage Buildings, WDB. Mm. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Thanks, everyone. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. Mark Cohen is nowhere to be seen.